Hi, folks. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, screen proteases or enzymes that we And they use a, a, a catalytic steering mechanism. Now I have here kind of this is the back of the uh, This screen here is our screen. After getting into any attack on our uh, on our substrate, which is uh, we also have a histidine here, which is used for acid base transfers. And then we have an aspartic acid, which is used to stabilize the histidine and shift the pKa upward. This means that uh, histidine is going to become more basic. And the whole idea here is to start this reaction, we need to pull off this hydrogen from the steering. As you might recall from organic uh, OAT, the not necessarily the nuclear files, it's more effective. And or a free lone pair of units in fact. So his team really needs to do pull that hair. And it will allow the bond electrons to attack something. Uh, but OH on the steering is not particularly acidic. It's PKA is out of the normal range. Um, and so his team kind of has to pull that hydrogen at the same time that it attacks. In order to do this, it needs to be a stronger base. And this aspartic acid the negative charge on that aspartic acid is going to help us to make that more basic. You can imagine if, if a histidine pulls that hydrogen, it's going to take on a positive charge. And then we're going to have an ionic attraction here between the positive histidine and the negative aspartic acid, which is a thermodynamic bonus uh, for the, we're going to build up this ionic attraction that we didn't have before. And that's going to help things move along. It's going to make uh, histidine essentially want to have a hydrogen more, which means, you know, a higher pH. Uh, so what we're going to see here as we move along is our substrate is going to bind. And you can see our substrate is a polypeptide. Again, the rest of the chain is here. Uh, different serine proteases will have different specificities. And so what we'll see is, for example, chymotrypsin, Would cut after would cut C terminal to Y, F, and W. That would be here in our R1. That would be Y, F, and W for chymotrypsin. For trypsin, we would cut C terminal to uh, R and K. So that means we'd have an R or a, an R gene or a lysine here at R1. Uh, for pepsin, we cut N terminal to uh, y, F, and W. Um, and so that means that R2, for example, would be O, F, and W. And so the different uh, serine proteases that we can talk about are going to have different specificities based on what their active site has. Um, the active site of our serine protease is going to have either a uh, nonpolar patch to bind to these aromatics uh, or a positive patch to bind to the, or a negative patch to bind to these positive side chains. So that's what gives our serine protease its specificity. Um, but all of them are going to have these three amino acids we talked about. These are called the single amino acids. And any one of them, if you mutate it, will cause a loss of function. You will well, no, no longer cut peptide bonds. It will suddenly become a useless um, enzyme that can't do anything. Um, catalytic triad does a lot for us. Um, by putting these particular three amino acids in this sequence close to one another, you're able to reduce a lot of the entropic cost. For example, we don't have to um, pay the entropic cost of making a nucleophile into the active site to get into the attack confirmation. We don't have to pay the entropic cost of getting a base into the right place at the right time. We don't have to pay the entropic cost of getting uh, a negative charge nearby to allow that to happen. It's already next to each other. So it cuts out a lot of the randomness. 
if we did this in free solution, the rate of peptide hydrolysis is very, very slow. You can get protein from nine hormones, essentially. Uh, it's so slow. Um, and so, by having enzymes, specifically strain proteases, having the catalytic triad, we reduce the randomness of the system and make it much, much more efficient. Uh, the other thing that's really important here is uh, feature within the enzyme. This is backbone really. Uh, but this is a feature called the oxyanide. And this contains, uh, usually, backbone amides from other amino acids in the protein. Uh, it can also contain positive charges uh, in different amino acids. But in this case, uh, we have backbone amides here. And you can see that these can hydrogen bond distance is too far here. It's not close enough. It only binds to the And you recall that the double dagger symbol with protein state. So it only is able to contact the transition states in some of the to stabilize them and speed up the brain. And so what our first step here again is going to be is for our histidine to pull off the straight hydrogen. That's going to give oxygen a negative charge buildup. And that's going to be our carbonyl. Okay. The carbonyl is then going to get up uh, a negative charge upon the oxygen. This is going to do a couple of things. It's going to pull down the uh, our, our OH into the active site. Right? Right. So we're actually going to be attaching our site to our enzyme. Right? Uh, we're also going to transfer a pop up on the histine, which is going to be uh, uh, And when you lose a little bit of the bond order here, it goes from the double bond to the two bond. Uh, what happens if you remember to bond one? Uh, it's that the bond so a double bond is totally on the That means that the O is expected here into the whole, and it's going to be able to make bonds on the state. Only in the transition state, or in a place where we have a proxy, where we need a lot of So you're going to see something like this. Our serine is now attached to our substrate. Our O negative is now a lengthening single bond, able to interact with that. Uh, with that off the anion. Now, this is the hardest part, right? Trying to get this double bond to break on its own uh, is not going to be particularly easy, chemically speaking. Um, and so, this is our rate determining step. So, going from there to here is going to be our rate. Number one, a carbonyl should be always should always win over a single bond O. Remember that a carbonyl has really good orbital overlap. It's really small. Um, it's, it's a perfect little system to, uh, to minimize the energy of the system. And, and you recall keto-enol tautomerism. We always prefer the, the ketone to the enol. Uh, and so this is going to be go a little bit of an uphill slog. We might imagine that going from that last step, we're going to be going uphill like this. Um, in free energy space. We talked about standard free energies here, we'd be going uphill. Uh, but remember that when we're talking about an enzyme, enzymes' jobs are to lower that transition state. Uh, and so that energy is suddenly a lot smaller. We call that a delta, delta G naught, double dagger. The change in free energy of the activation energy between the catalyzed and the uncatalyzed uh, rate constants, that would correlate to stabilizing the transition state through these hydrogen bonds, and also by cutting out the randomness due to this um, the arrangement of our pieces. And so we're going to get a, a rate acceleration. The larger that change in delta G is, the faster this enzyme will go. And that's how we can get these things to happen in reasonable amounts of time uh, compared to uh, free solution. So there we go. We have a nice tetrahedral intermediate.
that we've kind of invested a little bit in. This thing now wants to come back downhill, uh, you can imagine, because we've invested quite a bit of energy getting it from a double bond, a carbon neal, uh, to a single bond O, really kind of like a like an enolate or a hemiacetal kind of thing, acetal. Um, so obviously that's that's a bit of an uphill slog. And so this thing is going to want to reform a carbonyl at some point. And luckily for us, we have all the pieces we need to do that. Um, our negative charge is going to be able to pop that thing and take away the leaving group. And the leaving group could either be our O minus, uh, which could possibly happen, and that would be you know, a reverse of that. Or what we could do would be to kick off the other group. Um, N minuses are, are going to be a lot stronger bases than uh, N minuses. Uh, o like the part and does that much uh, negative. Uh, if we want to kick off the N and actually make reaction progress, we're going to have to luckily hit the D and have to put scrap. Our double bond O is going to reform. We're going to kick off the N. So we've just cleaved peptide bond. And so we've cut, cut, we've cut the protein. So what's going to happen to us uh, is we are going to now release our product one. Great. And that's going to float away uh, into the solution as a clear peptide. But then it's going to leave the space behind it. And so we're going to enter a water molecule into the space that was previously occupied by product one, our C-terminal peptide. Uh, that's good, uh, because we're going to need that to actually do the hydrolysis. Remember that hydrolysis is cleavage uh, with water. Last time we cleaved it with a serine. Uh, this time we're going to cleave it with water. You might realize the steps that are coming up here are very similar to the first two, but instead using the water instead of this CH2O8. Uh, well, we have our product one release, we have a water coming in. We can see that our product two, the other half of our product, one of our actives are still covalently linked to the thing. And if we want to do another round of cleavage, we're going to have to get this thing off. That's our main, our main goal in this. So his team, luckily, is now neutral. Basic enough that wants to pull hydrogen. Gonna pull that hydrogen. This bond is now gonna be attack our carbonyl, and it's gonna kick up the charge onto the oxygen. When it becomes a single bond here, remember it up and the oxygen. And that helps stabilize our transition state and our bond. So we have now a nice single bond of the heat water Again, that was our rate determining step. So we're going to need some help. Luckily, our oxyanion hole is helping us there, making these contacts. Uh, again, we have twice. We've gone uphill to our difficult step, just like last time. Right? We're going to want to go from a double bond O to a Remember, a single bond now, it's going to be convincing for our, for our model to do that. Um, so it's going to want to come back down and help form a carbonyl if it can. Uh, and it can, luckily, here, as long as we can pair back down and double bond. But if we do that, we're going to kick off a leaving group. We can kick off our OH, we can just be going backwards, or we can kick off our series. And it's going to have to grab a hydrogen on the way out. Luckily for us, um, our histidine has that. Looks like there's a small error here. Um, this should not have any lone pairs. That's it. Go away, lone pairs. All right, you get it. So there shouldn't be a lone pair on that guy. Um, so there we go. That is going to finish our mechanism, we're going to reform our carbonyl. We're then going to kick off our steering and grab a hydrogen on the way.
So to finish the mechanism, now we have released our product to Uh, we have a liberated product too that will float away into the solution, and we have a recharged serine, a recharged histidine, and a re and a acetic acid uh, still in our active site. These are in the same uh, the same charge states as they were originally, and if we look at this active site, this is exactly where we started. So we'd be ready for another to pop on in, and then we could repeat this. And so kind of a review, uh, we're going to use the serine to do the attack, and then we're going to use histidine to pull hydrogens as needed or add them back to keep off leaving groups. Aspartic acid didn't do anything, really. I mean, it was there, and it helped out histidine in doing its job, and it's a very important support role, um, but it doesn't actually do any chemistry. It doesn't push any arrows. It just hangs out and helps stabilize histidine, so it's kind of like a wingman or some sort of a, an assistant to this uh, histidine as it does its job. And so luckily for us, this is all back in the original state, so all we have to do is wait for that substrate to come. So I hope that helps, folks.